has been a momentous week on many, many fronts. And because one of our guests today stole the name of my uh, excellent uh, weekly panel discussion with a former employer and uh, turned it to his own evil purposes, we've now decided to call our Friday panel um, Free Speech Fridays because people can say whatever they want. They're not going to get it. Well, it might go to the complaint section. Ben is standing by like a coiled spring waiting for people to complain about what's on the platform. So joining us this week, and I think we've got the right intro for her now, reformed New Zealand Herald writer, Rachel Stewart, and left-wing darling, <laughs> former darling of the left, uh, publisher uh, in his own lifetime, stealer of great names for podcasts, uh, Martin Bomber Bradbury, also a regular contributor to the uh, opinion section on the platform. Good morning, uh, welcome, salutations to you both. We got Good you both. Bomber. All right, we've got now. You guys know each other, Rachel. You know Bomber. Bomber, do you know Rachel? Oh yes, absolutely. We, we, we go absolutely. way back. Okay, you've stalked yeah. each other on Twitter or something, and trolled each other on Twitter, have you? Well, but more oh, than that, I, I've always. I've, I've always respected uh, Rachel as one of the most important climate uh, crisis voices in this country uh, and Ooh. as an opinion maker and, and, and someone who deserved much more from the New Zealand Herald than she got. <laughs> Rachel, Ooh, your well, response. Gonna... Nice, nice yeah, work, by the way, Bomber. The... Yeah, I just know the word climate's going to get you going. Anyway, before I start, am I on Radio New Zealand? Because if, I feel like I've been <laughs> used, I, 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 I don't think I should be here. Rachel, OK, look, I, wasn't, I was going to leave that to Lynn, but let's go there. I would say I'm normally a man of, of good humour, even when people are having a go at me. But a little bit of me was, was a bit peeved that she said I'd talk to Sean. Essentially, she was saying, this is the nice lady from Countdown, I'd be happy to talk to Sean if I thought he was on Radio New Zealand and was like a whipping boy for the Liberal left, but not if he's on the platform. That's a whole different thing. And I was a little upset. Do you think rightly so, Rachel? Oh, I just... It was, I, it was priceless. She made an absolute tit of herself. Uh, good honour for going to New Zealand, but uh, she... I just think she's let Countdown down and, and um, Countdown down down. Yeah. And um, yeah, I thought it was brilliant. It was a re it was a really good um, event that happened, and I think she should be crying into her oat, oat milk this morning. Yeah, Martin, uh, I don't know if you went back and heard it and what transpired. It was all pretty well spontaneous, and in the moment, I thought the most amazing thing was she said, "Look, really, I don't want." We put out a press release. We don't really want to be interviewed by anyone who might ask us a difficult question. That wouldn't be fair on our team, mm. and it just seems to me that that actually was very revealing. That is what an awful lot of organisations and government departments, yep. that's the way they think. Oh, God, yes, we're open and transparent, but not if you ask us a difficult question, Bomber. Well, when you look at and consider the billion dollars that is being spent every single year by this government on consultants and the extra jump in almost every single government department in terms of their PR hacks, yeah, of course, of course, of course they, they, nobody, nobody wants to be asked a question they don't already know the answer that's coming. That's the way, because the only, the only way MPs get held to account or the ministers get held to account is if bad stories come out in the media. So one way to just completely make sure that never happens is only stick to certain state uh, gatekeeper media, stay there, and you won't be asked harder questions. That, that's the game now. Yeah, and, and of course this woman is moving on to be the head of sustainability at Air New Zealand, and... She's hard to find a more woke, woke corporate than Air New Zealand, is there, Rachel? But she's head of sustainability for a, a company that probably creates more um, greenhouse gas or mm. whatever you call it, carbon, than any mm. other in New Zealand, mm. eh? Yeah. I mean, you know, the morals and ethics of these things are very um, fluid and flexible. And uh, I guess she'll somehow didn't tell herself that she's helping the world, but until we have another option in terms of biofuels, which we do not have and, and, and it hasn't worked out so far, then, you know, she's just like every other polluter out there, like all of us. Right, but as long as I doubt that we're going to be doing many interviews about the sustainability of Air New Zealand uh, in the near future on the but, platform. But, guys, look, and look, I'm going to leave it up to you. What do we go to next? Because, well, actually, 
Yeah, two big stories. Well, no, three big stories to me. Three dominant mm. issues this week. Um, I'll get, let you guys decide. Um, so we've got the end of mandates, end of masks, Maori language week, and the death of HRH. Where do we want to go first, Marty? Martin, where do you want to go first? Oh, let's, 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 let's. Well, I mean, I, I, I think the Queen's passing right. uh, is, 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 a pretty, is a pretty big issue. Yeah, we pretty big talk, news we, we, there in Wanganui, Rachel, the passing of, of <laughs> Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> Oh, yeah, Wanganui well, actually is part of New Zealand. Um, yeah, Te Araua, sorry. And, yeah. Uh, and yes, pretty big news here too. Yes, yeah. very big. Okay, let's let's get personal. Because, and no hugging, thank God we can't hug each other. Um, Martin, what does it mean to you? And I know you're a Republican, but what is the passing of the Queen? Are you surprisingly, as every single television reporter from New Zealand I've seen, or, or journalist, are you surprised at how emotional you are at the, the passing of the Queen? Uh, there are only three queens that you should worship, uh, Beyonce, Freddie Mercury and Elizabeth II. She is, without a question, one of the pillars and cornerstones of Western democracy in the 20th century. Her seven decades mm -hmm. of service. Uh, again, you're absolutely right, I'm no monarchist. Uh, and, and, and there are, you know, issues of the empire that will need to be debated. And there are issues of the, 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 the privilege of the dynasty. All of those things can be done at, at, at a later date. I think that people respected that she actually showed what uh, duty and obligation and service of duty, what that actually meant to that generation. Because that kind of service and duty doesn't exist now. And I think that's why there is so much of a personal outpouring of emotion towards her, because she embodied values of a time in society which we don't really have these days. All right, Rachel, that was pretty eloquent from Bomber. I would say that yeah. we're in the grip of some mass grief hysteria like we were with... Diana, um, but you, are you also surprised at the personal depth of your emotional response to the passing of the monarch? Um, but you kind of, but mine, mine is quite personal in the sense that, you know, she was a good mate. No, she wasn't. But um, <laughs> what my first memory as a child, um, I have a mother who's dead, as many people do, and my first memory as a child is being wheeled down to the corner of our country road onto the main road at 1967, and I would have been about four and a half. Yeah. And she had me in some sort of stroller. And we were going to see the Queen. I said, well, I don't bloody think so. But anyway, off we went. And sure enough, the Queen had been in Wanganui staying at the now the Braeburn Apartments. It was a hotel back in the day. That was the 67. And she went. She was on her way to Ratahi, and Mum said, look out for a sort of a, a black car. And sure enough, a black car with the police, an old Holden, you know, um, with the blue thing on top, went past and I saw this white gloved hand sort of wave. We're the only ones on the, the corner. Classic, the classic, just, just the glove, yeah. just the wave. Yeah, just the, just the glove. And my mother was just thrilled. Anyway, my mother then, and, and that was my, <laughs> that's really my first memory. But then she went on to work. She was the head of the household for the Governor General in Wellington then. In the Your mother? 80s. Yes, she was, Yeah. yeah. And so she worked with David Beatty, and of course Diana and um, Charles came out in the Buzzy Bee. That was in Auckland, but that that tour, um, and she organised all the household people and probably cleaned. I think she even cleaned Diana and Charles's toilets because nobody else was allowed in. So the your area. mum was a true forelock tugger. Absolutely, absolutely. So for me, it's all wound up with dead mother, who I used to laugh at her pictures of the Queen on the wall and all the signed pictures. But you know. This was the matriarch of. This was my matriarch. So your mum wouldn't yeah. might have met the queen, or at least made her bed yes, or did. something. She did meet the yes, queen. She did. Yes, she did. Did she yeah. have a picture she with her with the queen? Child. Yes, not all that. Yes. Did the queen send Absolutely a telegram fine. when your mum died? No, she didn't. But uh, I'm my grateful. mum died so quite sorry. young. I am grateful. All. But anyway, so for me, it's wrapped up in the death of my mother, who died twenty years ago now. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, but, you know, Queen is the fire matriarch of all of us. And so all I've mm. known is, is, is the Queen and growing up with a mother who was complete. I'm not a royalist, but I see its point. I see what the monarchy is, and I think these discussions, like Bomber has so eloquently said in one of his columns, his beautiful, eloquent columns that he writes, yeah. um, that, uh, you know, we should have this discussion later about, you know... But uh, I think we do have to have the discussion, and I think oh, we yes, get we so... 
And I'm sorry, I feel like giving you a hug now, Rachel, after you've told Thank that you, story. Darling. You're going to need months of counselling for that. Um, <laughs> but, but I think we should have <laughs> the discussion, and I look at this guy yeah. who loses his rag over a pen, and and I think it is the time, isn't it, Bomber, to say, what is all this about? Well, look, I mean, I think that it, you're right. It is the time to ask about where is the constitutional future of this country. But I think that when you look at the inability to debate co-governance and three waters in any rational way, the idea of actually <laughs> talking about how is the government going to respond and react yeah. directly to the issues of the treaty, I think our inability to be able to talk over just basic stuff yeah. means those big stories, come on, we would rip our throats that out if we if, if we were to have a debate about that right now. Yeah, I, I, I do yeah. see your, your, your trepidation. All right, let's move on and, and look, you know, I hope the funeral goes off well, and I just want to say I think it's amazing that the British do the most British thing in the face of national tragedy. They form the greatest queue in the history of, of the world, and, like, that's their big achievement. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the end of mandate, the end of masks, and, in fact, they will end. I think the emergency orders end on the day, Monday after next, when we are having this holiday. But essentially... The government, on Monday, the Prime Minister announced, we've all had enough, um, stay home for seven days if you catch the Omicron. But it's kind of over, and it felt to me like a significant day in moving towards a post-COVID world, although Susie Wiles still tells me I should be packing my trousers about this, Rachel. Yeah, oh, well, that's, that's what she does. Um, it is a significant day, but I, I, you know, I'm I'm not kind of with you two on on um, anything to do with mandates or masks. I haven't really been wearing my masks for the last years. Yeah. I couldn't care less. Um, I didn't buy into the hype. I know everyone felt that we should. I still don't believe that the vaccine has been safe or effective, mm. uh, as it turns out. And, I, I, and um, mandates should never happen. I've watched people like you about lose jobs and yeah. go on to do better things because they're those kind of people. They just stepped up. But, you know, I think having made nurses, you know, who we need more than anything, or people just lose their jobs, social workers who had to work in health. Yeah. Everybody needs social workers. We have a mental health crisis, for God's sake. So young people were losing their jobs, young social workers, and having to... I just found the whole thing appalling, and I'm not with you on that subject. I know we had what they called a pandemic. I'm not even sure mm. I'd call it that. But looking back on it now, really, was it worth it, all the mental health problems that we're facing now? Okay, so, so you're saying good day, but you never believed in any of the rubbish anyway, and you still think there is residual damage more to our society than to the health of anyone who's caught COVID? Yeah. Rachel? Ye yes, I, I, I won't say I never believed in it. What I did was I watched what was unfolding, took my time to think about things, and then thought, this isn't worth the paper it's written on. And now we've got Denmark saying you have to get a doctor it came out yesterday, you have to get a doctor to sign off if you're going to get the vax if you're under 50. you got Germany saying, no, that you've got to be over 50 to get it. Um, it's starting to happen. It's starting to come out. Mainstream media hasn't. Uh, and I'm not some rabid, you know, free... No, no, um, I get you. And, and look, I will be honest, Rachel, I think there is a... And I don't know about you, Bomber, I think that... I think that in the, the heat of a crisis, people are prepared to do and accept things that with more time to reflect, they might not. And we now have the time to reflect and we might not be entirely happy with some of the decisions we made, Bomber. Can't disagree with you more. Uh, the Lancet report that came out yesterday showing 17.7 .7 million global deaths uh, and, and, and reviewing New Zealand's uh, stance and all of that makes fascinating reading, and I, I, I suggest all the platform listeners go and read that Lancet report. Um, it, it shows that we did a, 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 a pretty good job. Uh, in How many New Zealanders life. died from COVID, Martin? I think about 2,000 is the current number. Uh, well, but they died, didn't die, they died with... Well, well of, of COVID, man. How many New Zealanders died oh, of COVID? Oh, uh, hey, hey, hey. Are any of us doctors? No. So uh, I'm going to leave. No, that but to even the doctors can't because, tell you that. Because, That's the problem. Well, you know, well, yeah. well, uh, 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 we'll, we'll agree to disagree. I, I, I think the lifting of the mandates um, is is bad news for the far left, the identitarians who have welded mask wearing 
and and, and 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 screaming social distancing every single time have sort of welded that into their identity. Uh, it's a bad day for them because they, they want the country in level seven. And it's also a bad day for the far right, the QAnon lunatics and the federal yeah. anti-vaxxers who were claiming that, that, that Jacinda was part of a Nazi uh, secret police taking over the country with police powers. Well, the moment that this passed and we could move back to being normal, the government did that. So I think, I think politically, uh, after a summer uh, and after these, conv- these, these restrictions being lifted, I think a lot of the grumpiness and anger mm. will have passed uh, in, 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 in time for the election next year. Yeah, I, I, I hear. Okay, so we, we, we approach things differently. I want to pick up what you said for the virtue signalers, for the, for the lefty trolls, but they now have this new hashtag, hashtag mask for your mates, um, which I've been taking the borax out of this week. But it's fantastic, Rachel. You now, it's not just your pronouns, him, her, them, they, that oh. can mark you out as a better human being than everyone else. You can wear a mask to show what a woke snowflake you are. You can, and it's quite good because you can spot them now uh, in the last few days, and I and I do feel like putting my foot out and tripping them over, but I, I do resist and I restrain myself from doing that because I just think it's uh, nuts. I just don't know what people are doing. I mean, I, I, I guess if the odd person is immunocompromised and worried, you know, the flu was here before this. I mean, it's uh, anyone yeah. immunocompromised has to think about whether they just go out in society or stay home and do their knitting. I did you? Ha- did either of you have COVID? Get COVID? Yeah, yeah. And what was it like? I, was, re- I, I was really lucky in that I haven't caught it. And I mean, as, 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 far, as far as I'm, I'm absolutely aware. I never tested positive. Uh, never had it for this entire period of time. And I, I, I could either just be one of those lucky people that the virus bounces off or, you know, I had it, but it was, it, 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 I didn't feel it at all. Um, I'm, I'm, I've just been incredibly lucky. And, and, I, and I think I look at the arguments, oh, it's just like the flu or it's just like influenza. What we're seeing with the long COVID, what we're seeing in, particularly in terms of damage to the heart that the COVID uh, virus can cause, I don't think it's... It's 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 just a cold that you could bounce off. I mean, I I, I wouldn't want to catch it. I wouldn't want to catch. It. Well, Rachel, you've had it. How was it? Do you have long COVID? Oh, it, was, it was it was fine. It was two weeks of feeling incredibly tired. It wasn't worse than the the flu that we get from Asia. I mean, and Bomber, you know, talking about heart injuries, I've, there's a hell of a lot of people that have had the vax that have fallen down with pericarditis and myocarditis. My oh, no, absolutely, one. absolutely, absolutely. And whenever you have a mass vaccination event, there is always a percentage yeah. of the population who are going to have a negative response to it, which is why a vaccination always has to be voluntary. You can't make it mandatory and yes. force people to take a medicine but which we might actually injure them, right? But we did. No, what, no, no, we did. no one was held yes, down but we and did. No, no, well, no one sorry, was, but when, who, when who I was held down and ejected. Their bloody job. When I watched yeah, well, that, and, and, and bloody that, job, and that's, that's not unfortunate. right. Unfortunate. That was an unfortunate oh, byproduct. Unfortunate. Wasn't it? Okay. No, and no, I must it's say, no I, good. I, I'm with Rachel on no this, and I, and I think going from the team of five million to that often played clip where a journalist asks the, pri- the Prime Minister and says, isn't this essentially creating two classes of citizens? And she goes, yes, it is. There's the moment you lost me, Martin. Yeah. yeah, but I, I mean, again, when you're facing a once-in-a-century pandemic... You but, we to, oh, that, but, but we weren't. But we weren't, Martin. Lost. It turns out we, we were. But we did. But we did. But nah, we did. Nah, you just think but a bit better, mate. I'm surprised that you just think well, a bit How did now. those 17.7 million die globally? What, yeah, but did they die of or with? Oh, oh, What's they? the average but age, Martin, of the people who have died in New Zealand? Uh, oh, it's, oh, it's, it's, oh, it's very much an elderly, very much something yeah. because yeah. of our high vaccination yeah. rates. Because of our high vaccination rates. Uh, Boy, okay. okay. All right. All yeah. right, Martin. All right. Look, and this is interesting. I think you're both reasonable, <laughs> rational people who I like, but you have completely different views. Uh, on mm-hmm. this, and, and it's I okay. just and it's okay for us to have a completely okay. different view. Yeah, uh, but yeah unless you want to okay. keep your job, Martin, and then it's not okay. Then you lose your job. Well. Or, or is it okay if you want to stand for local council because you're going to have stuff and others labelling you a Nazi? Well, again, yeah. the issue there, I think we can all see 
that, of course, in a liberal progressive democracy, anyone who wants to stand up and, 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 and participate in the democratic process should be allowed to. Where the issue is, and I think, you know, it's, it's a fair issue, is if you're standing with a secret agenda that you don't want anyone else to know about, oh. that's actually problematic. That's actually problematic. No. If, these guys, no. if these guys want to step forward and say, we believe, and then they list all the What's things the they believe. What's the secret agenda? What's the secret agenda? Somebody well, but, emailed but, but, Voices but, for Freedom. What is the, the, the the oh. secret agenda nah, as yeah. articulated by the people who are actually doing it is that they know oh, you're being a fascist if now. people you're being know. A fascist now. <laughs> <laughs> I see, how, I see how fascism is it being in fascist you now? to demand that people are upfront about what they want and what they believe in? All right. Okay, so why don't so if somebody stands for council, should we know if they yes. if they had a secret affair with the neighbours? You know what? What is a, a secret I mean, affair with a neighbour? Whoever has got nothing to do with their role as councillor. Oh yeah, no, it drives to character. Secret Absolutely, Martin. I'm more likely to vote for them if they did. Um, <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Now, now, look, I think that's a perfect example of where we're at with that. But I respect the fact that you guys can disagree and be heated and everything else. It has been most an amazing time. I think in some ways, though, it's over, and I think there are going to be a lot of people who are going to have to find something else to argue about. So let's just wrap it up with, what does Māori Language Week mean to you, Rachel? Well, uh, you know, I... It's... Look, we've got to make space for... And I'm, I'm going to make... Uh, I love the Māori language. It's a beautiful language. I come from Wanganui. Uh, my home is from the Wanganui River. Lower reaches. Um, I love hearing it. I love speaking it occasionally. My father was pretty, pretty good at it, and he was a he was a white man, um, and he, but he worked the shearing circuit, so he spoke it quite regularly. I love it. So, Pucky, I need to make space for that. But where it falls down is it's like the LGBTQI alphabet soup bullshit. It's forcing people to have to make have to telling Pucky that they should learn it when they. When they don't want to, 2.6 to 2.7% of Maori, according to Graham Adams the other day, or Scotty yep. Morrison, actually. Yeah, yeah, um, that was a great column. It was a great column. And he really did the research. The point is that we're being... It, it seems like we need good and bad, but evil and, and, you know, black and white. The fact remains that Maori are the, Maori are the ones that are going to have to save their own language and to constantly push it on to Pākehā as if we need to do this too, but also it's your fault that it's dying, is, it seems to be going up the wrong street. But I do think it's a beautiful language and we constantly need to make space for it. And I think we are. In fact, we're making probably a little bit too much space ah, for it. OK, a little too much space. We've perhaps over-egged this. Oh, Bomber, tell me about your spiritual journey and how wonderful it is for you. Uh, when I was 18, I had a car accident that left me with a serious head injury, and it damaged the part of my brain where I formulate language. And I've always felt quite self-conscious about it. Sometimes I completely mangle the pronunciation of a word without even realising it. Uh, my te reo uh, is, 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 is pigeon Māori. It's kia ora, it's kia kaha, it's ka pai. Uh, but that's, that, that is the range of my Māori. And, and, and I've never wanted, I've always felt self-conscious about pronouncing te because I've always feared some little jumped up woke pronunciation policing fascist <laughs> is going to jump mm -hmm. on me for my mispronunciation. And no, they're, not, they're now going to patronise you and, and they're going to say, so good on you for trying. And, 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 or whatever, and, 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 and then I'll get cancelled. Look, I get cancelled every month. I don't need another target on my back for that. So I just don't. But, however, I do believe that it is a cultural treasure. And I did believe that it was my daughter's birthright to have access to that. So throughout her entire education, she's been in a bilingual class. And she's the only Pākehā in her class, which is a bit of a tragedy in itself. But when she does the te reo at home, when she does the, 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 the papiha, when she does the, 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 uh, the little prayer, um, when she does those things, it makes me feel more connected to New Zealand than anything else. It melts my black, cynical heart because it's a gift and I think it's beautiful. But the problem, which is exactly as, as Rachel pointed out, is that it's now become a virtual signal by the professional managerial class to cudgel mm -hmm other people mm -hmm. into feeling guilt or shame 
And as I think you also get some brown washing in these government departments. I mean, Oranga Tamariki, they give it a Māori name and then completely ignore all the damage they do to Māori children. And, 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 right. and, and, and while it's, I, I think while it's an important gift that we should treasure and I respect, I think it's being used as a woke virtue signalling cudgel to be- beat the bejesus out of other people. And I think that that when you've got 27,000 people waiting on the emergency housing wait list, you've got what, 200,000 kids living in... Doesn't school. matter what they're talking, they're still going to be cold and disadvantaged and hungry, oh, aren't exactly. they? What, what, yeah. what, is, what is the point of today if those 480 kids who are living in cars are still living in cars, you know? Yeah. Hey, guys, that is, I think, all we've got time for. I love your mahi, man. <laughs> and I love your mahi, Rachel. And I'm yeah, glad that you nice. disagree and you can respectfully disagree. A lot of people have texted in and, sorry, Bomber, Rachel won, Bomber zero. Yeah, there Ooh. we go, there we go. All right. There you go. Okay, there Bye, you go. Bomber. Though I will say you're both welcome any time, Martin, even if you did steal the working group title off me and use it for your own financial gain. <laughs> um, and I hope you... No, no hugs, which was great. That's because we were on the phone. And I hope you can all come to terms with your grief before the next time we talk again. Rachel Stewart and Bomber Bradbury, our Friday uh, free speech uh, panel.